the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'll, me, and Chris, uh, me and Cha are going to walk you through the progress we have made with CNTK, how it is used, and what all are the key features that makes the toolkit really attractive. Uh, I am a ML scientist with the CNTK team, and Cha is the principal researcher and the dev manager for CNTK. We're going to talk about the toolkit with respect to scalability and speed of training as well. That is one of the key hallmarks for what CNTK finds usage in a large number of production loads that we run at Microsoft, and increasingly with our customers who are looking into efficiency with which they can use these resources in a cloud environment or in their local setup to more efficiently use their compute resource. So I'm going to primarily cover an overview and a brief demo. Then Cha is going to come and talk about CNTK, uh, the key differentiators and features, and also allude to some of the educational resources that we have been putting efforts behind so that you can possibly leverage you and your colleagues if you are trying to teach the next generation how to do deep learning efficiently. So deep learning is, as I was mentioning, powered, powering Microsoft in various applications and end-to-end -end user experiences. So Microsoft Cognitive Services, Skype Translator, Cortana, all these technologies are empowered by CNTK in one shape, form, or the other. Being search, being ads, uses CNTK, HoloLens, some of these things you have either already heard in different kinds of forums, or you'll hear as I go along speak and introduce briefly to the different use cases. And powering many of the differentiators that make this toolkit unique are researchers and their contributions to the toolkit from Microsoft Research. One of the hallmarks of CNTK uh, was scalability. And this is demonstrated by the fact that last year, uh, the speech researchers re reached a very historic moment in achieving human parity with conversational speech. And what I want to emphasize is that if, when you're doing deep learning, you have to deal with a large amount of data. The more data you throw at it, for practical problems, it becomes more amenable to achieving human-like performance. And you need scalability. So before using CNTK, the iterative process with which the research team was uh, doing the modeling was about six to eight weeks. And we, once they switched to CNTK, they were able to iterate every, every week and which led to reaching them this landmark moment with agility. You can find more details in the paper that is cited. ImageNet challenge is very popular in computer vision, and the residual network, which is pretty much where everybody starts today when they do computer vision applications, uh, came from Microsoft Research, so we are very proud about that moment. And the, I mean, if you look at the, the new benchmarks that are coming through from uh, the ImageNet, it, it is like incremental changes that are happening over the 3.5 error rate that was uh, achieved in 2015, about two years back. Today, these technologies are available to you in CNTK and even more so in the form of recipes uh, and tutorials that even a beginner who is new to deep learning can easily try their hands on and figure out, yeah, you know, it's not that hard. It's not black magic. It's pretty straightforward. And then go on to develop the next generation innovation on top of it. Cognitive services uh, has, is a bunch of APIs that people are using to build different kinds of ex experiences in bots, in uh, web services, different kinds of applications on their phones. So vision is one of the key areas where computer, uh, where deep learning has made a huge impact. So uh, face API, motion APIs, many of these APIs are available to uh, you and others who are using cognitive services, and they leverage CNTK as their deep learning platform. Similarly, speech, language, knowledge mining, and search, all of these use CNTK in some shape, form, or the other. Uh, I like to get the uh, interact with the audience. So, how many of you have heard about or tried the how-all.net? Okay. Uh, yeah, if many of you haven't. Please give it a shot. And if you have young kids at home, give them a chance to interact with it. 
they get familiar with AI, they have fun along the way. Uh, my, my kids put a lot of different faces on it and figure out how to break the system. And as you do so, the machine gets even better and better. So these APIs these, uh, that are used behind the scenes learn from the data that comes through these different kinds of applications. And increasingly, when, uh, when the how dash -all .net started and now, the accuracy of predictions have gone significantly up. Uh, similarly, caption bot, this generates captions for images that you throw at it. It's, it can be occasionally quite funny, and it's interesting. If you are just curious, throw some uh, pictures at it, and uh, you can get bemused by the captions that come out. Some of them are scarily spot on. So like this one, I won't bother reading it into it, but it reads about that the, there's a kid, and he's kind of neutral in his um, expression, but also there are other kids surrounding him. And interesting is that they have all their faces that are facing backwards. Leveraging these APIs are startups. The, this Libhair is a company who's working with Microsoft in delivering a new generation refrigerator where you're able to identify things inside the refrigerator using CNTK. Healthcare is going through a revolution and AI is central to it. So this company, which works with the Uh, in China, the hospital there are uses 100 CNTK. million people with diabetes. Diabetic retinopathy, or DR, is one of the most common complications of diabetes. Patients will go blind without proper treatment. Ad dog DR is very useful and very easy to use. Just upload the photos and it will give the diagnosis. We leverage our deep learning technologies, uh, as you know, with a set of open source tools like Linux and Python. Training deep learning models in Azure is very easy. With support of distributed training feature in cognitive toolkits, we can shorten the training time so we can iterate our algorithm quickly. Azure provides N24 server, which is GPU server we use a lot. And your commercial availability ensures our data security as well as our mission critical service level to our customers. Every day is a great day because we are saving people's lives. Here's another customer uh, who was using some other toolkits and recently chose to move over to using CNTK to leverage the scalability and especially they leverage the Azure stack, the GPUs that are available. Uh, and they are delivering an awesome experience in they in doing some image related tasks in this case what was happening is they want to scrape off different websites to find what's the price of a given item should be so previously they were using text based technologies which have uh, uh, which doesn't go very well because with image and clothing clothing go much better in terms of a visual representation, if it's a flowery dress, it is much easier to compare with images than with text. So by switching over to deep learning models using CNTK, they are able to get very, very high accuracy. And they, when they transitioned over from their previous toolkit to CNTK, it was a rather a sh very short duration. In a matter of less than a week, they were able to translate and uh, scale across multiple GPUs. So when you get to using CNTK across multiple GPUs, it's pretty much a line of code that allows you to just target all the GPUs that you want to go after. The setup is very, very easy. So in this case, the customer is seeking for image similarity, and based on similar images, they scrape off prices and then build a price comparison database that they then uh, develop different user experience on top of it. Bing and Bing Ads are big CNTK users, and they have bring a lot of uh, workloads to the toolkit. And here you leverage a lot of text and multimodal data sets with images. So in, in this left-hand panel, you can see that uh, here the generic query with the fruit is highlighting the specific instances of the fruits. And this is not just a fruit classifier. This is a generate language understanding model that you can very effectively build uh, using deep learning and deliver really, really nice experiences. 
On the right hand side here you're combining text with images where you are able to decipher different queries and match it with the assets, the visual assets that are being displayed uh, in this, uh, the search ads that is being showed. And you can search, search relevant books in this case, but also filter out irrelevant ones and the malicious ones are the ones that may not be quite appropriate for the query. You already saw a demo on the translation uh, experiences that we are developing. You can go to this site and uh, download an download an uh, app on your phone. And then, given the number of languages we speak in this room itself, you can imagine that if, as I'm speaking in English, and you you are more comfortable with your native language, how much more r richer experience it would be if you could deliver an accurate translation, which is now possible. Uh, uh, with the, the translate effort that is leveraging deep learning models behind the scenes. This is also made available to you through PowerPoint. So as you are, as I'm presenting this thing, you could have a plugin, PowerPoint plugin that is available to you that would uh, translate my talk into subtitles. Or if you had the app going along with it, it will translate it into your native language as well. Here is another example of Skype translator. Let's see, let me quickly run it through. It's very often at times as we interact across global boundaries, uh, we run into the challenges where we, we are more comfortable in speaking in our native language, but the other person may or may not be, uh, be comfortable with, or may, that may be a different language they want to choose. This YouTube link actually has a nice video uh, for network reasons. If it doesn't load, I'll, uh, will the slides have, you'll have access to the slides and you can run it on your own machines and see with Skype Translator, unless you have already used the feature, how convenient it is to work across multiple language boundaries. Yeah. Ah, it came up now. All right. It's speak your language. Die ich dir gestern geschickt habe. But I wanted to talk to you about the email that I sent you yesterday. Brauchst du noch irgendwelche Änderungen? Do you need any changes? There was one thing though. Could you change the green to a lighter shade? Könnten Sie das Grün durch einen helleren Farbton ändern? Ja, wir können das Grün viel heller machen. Yes, we can make the green much brighter. Ich sehe. I'm going to just stop it here, but you can watch the rest of the video um, later on. This is another area where deep learning really shines, which is the Microsoft customer support agent. How many of you have heard about it? OK, so three people in the room. I, all right. So it is quite powerful and empowering application of deep learning. It's powered by many, many components, but CNTK is central to it. The idea is that you could leverage the corpus, knowledge corpus that is available to you using an automated agent who can then deliver a very nice experience. Now what this experience would be, let's walk you through. So somebody, say, comes to this uh, customer support agent, and I'm sure you have been on the phone with agents, and depending on human agents trained, and as you get into them, you see a varying degree of quality. In this case, the first greeting that comes, through, comes to you is from a bot, that is our virtual assistant. And in this case, the person actually makes a very nice uh, welcome, and then you can say that in your own natural language that I'm having trouble setting up a new projector for my laptop, it's an Epson VS240. Now, parsing this, can be challenging. It may be natural to us, but the fact that this Epson VS 240 is a projector, those associations are automatically learned and very easily done with deep learning. So this agent actually uses various components of deep learning, feed-forward network, LSTMs, and reinforcement learning and a combination of these to deliver the experience that I'm just going to walk you through. So in this case, the agent comes back and says that this is the steps that you need to take. And then if you're not happy, then the agent uh, tries to respond with an updated answer, a different one. And the idea is that you're interacting with the agent all the time. And at some point, the 
virtual assistant knows that it's not as the uh, answers they are delivering is not as good as it should be, or it's not satisfying the end user, and at that point it can engage the right expert who would know the answer. So this is leading to a vast amount of savings uh, and a huge increase in customer experience. This is a wide open field for research and innovations because the number of questions you have in this world are quite a few, domains are different, so there's a huge amount of opportunity. I'm gonna skip these slides uh, real quick because uh, Chris has already gone through them and I will focus on some of the things that really make CNTK attractive to our community. So this is some benchmarking results by Hong Kong Baptist University. There's a group of researchers who periodically uh, compare different toolkits and present their results. In this case, uh, the latest one that they came up with uh, presents CNTK in a, a rather very impressive way. Uh, you can see that, that the, the number here, the lower it, the better it is. It's the, uh, for different networks, this is a fully connected network. This is the AlexNet, ResNet, and LSTMs. How much time does it take to uh, train a model on the different kinds of different hardwares that they have? Now you can read the paper uh, in, uh, in the link that is out there, but one thing that will pop out to you is LSTM. These are the, uh, the recurrence-based networks that we have. Because this came from the speech research group, the toolkit is uniquely designed to be able to very efficiently uh, scale up for these kind of networks very efficiently do the computes. But as you go through the tutorials and the material that we have for these networks, you'll find that it's really easy to code. For the students that I have taught in the classes, that's one of the consistent feedback I get, is that it really makes the recurrence much, much simpler. I don't have time to explain to you in much more details how it is done, but Sha will get a little bit into it. But if you're really interested, go. please take a time and go to the tutorials and if there's a tutorial on language understanding CNTK202, you can take a quick look at it and hopefully it'll uh, quickly transpire to you how e easy it, it can be to build like, recurrences and build classifications and regression models on top of it. Powering this scalability is that not we didn't wake up one fine day and just it worked out like uh, right off the gate, but it has been the, one of the key design tenets behind the toolkit back in 2015 when no other toolkits were supporting multiple GPU servers, CNTK was one of the first toolkit that had it. And uh, subsequently now the green bars pop up in every other toolkit that is there. It's kind of the norm. Um, Chris already has talked about us delivering multi-GPU scaling. So this is uh, a benchmark done using CNTK uh, with an, our partnership with NVIDIA. Here is another example where NVIDIA's DGX computers have uh, CNTK enabled as a, one of the default choices for computing and scaling across the multiple GPUs that this machine packs. Chris has already walked you through this particular, uh, the plot below, but I would like to additionally emphasize is that our, not only just scalability, but giving state-of-the-art recipes available to you in working conditions across multiple platforms is also a very key important uh, aspect of CNTK. In this case, we have rendered NVIDIA's CEO with Picasso style using a neural style rendering, and this is available to you as a tutorial. Have your own painting, uh, have your own picture painted in your preferred style. CNTK 205 is the tutorial if you want to know how it works. It's a few lines of code. It's not, shouldn't take you too long to understand how, what, how to make it work. Here is another example for scalability. Uh, at NIPS, uh, Cray announced them, uh, their partnership with us in scaling up uh, <coughs> deep learning platforms on their uh, supercomputer with 1,000 NVIDIA Tesla P100 GPUs. All right, just to quick summary, some of the key advantages for CNTK are the uh, be, uh, besides the scalability part that I talked about is our support now we have for Python and the C++ APIs. Mostly it's mostly implemented in C++ with both low level and high level Python APIs are available to you. We provide extensibility so if you have your own functions, users can extend those APIs 
with user functions and learners in pure Python. Uh, readers, we, I didn't get a chance to talk much about readers today. Uh, readers are key to deep learning. So if you are going to build a model that fits all in memory or you have all the data sitting in a given hard disk, it's relatively easy to kind of randomly chunk them and feed it into the modeling pipeline. But when you get to very large scale applications like the ones we deal with at Microsoft, it is no longer that easy to uh, do that randomization and uh, balance the compute load with the I.O. load. So the CNTK readers that are distributed to you comes out of the box capable of scaling to a large, large amount of data. So when you build your prototypes by using these readers, automatically it will scale up when you build a real application. So that's one of the reasons many of these customers who are coming to us are pleasantly surprised at how little time it takes for them to build scalable architecture. So from an academic standpoint, it also becomes very important to keep that in mind as we are paying attention to modeling and solving those models that the entire pipeline has to be kept in mind when building these recipes or coming up with new solutions uh, that uh, bring differentiations and breakthroughs in deep learning um, community. A couple of things I would like to highlight is Keras interoperability uh, with CNTK backend. It's a one line change. If you have Keras set up on your machine with TensorFlow or Theano, you could just switch the backend to CNTK and leverage some of the benefits that the toolkit provides. Um, you can uh, interchangeably train models and run them with CNTK. And uh, I'm going to uh, demo. Uh, uh, a reinforcement learning exp um, example with DQN, where the model was trained in TensorFlow and we are running it in CNTK. You can do vice versa. Uh, it literally took me 20 minutes to get this thing going. It was uh, not too hard to uh, get this Keras example, a recipe that's out there to run on um, CNTK. And you get the benefits of whatever I have talked so far about CNTK by doing so. And Chris did allude to uh, about model compression and binary evaluation is very, very key to it. Uh, this is another example I'll shortly show to you. So for the uh, reinforcement learning, this is a Flappy Bird example where you follow the following steps. You have the grain scheme in input, you pre-process the image, then you have a convolution net, and then you predict whether the bird should flap or not, and you use key learning to maximize the reward. You can find the original code at this GitHub site in the screen here. And this is the model that got trained. And let me see if I can quickly do a demo of this. So, <coughs> all right. So this training takes a long time uh, for reinforcement learning things, but we are, because we are using a TensorFlow model and running it, it's pretty straightforward. I also have the training code in the example. It will be shortly released in the uh, one of the as one of the examples in uh, CNTK uh, GitHub site. All right, I have one last demo. After that, I'll give it to Shah. So here is the, the binary evaluation videos. All right. So with, without binary evaluation and with binary evaluation, you can see that things work a lot faster. And uh, on the CPU, it works very, very efficiently. You can get 7 to 10 times speed up. Uh, without loss of much accuracy. Sha, would you? Uh, we'll take questions at the end, I think, right? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so, um, Sayang gave you an introduction of what 
you know, all those application scenarios and, uh, you know, general what advantages of CNTK. Uh, so um, my part of the talk, I'm going to dive a little deeper and tell you a bit about, you know, why we can, you know, how we can make CNTK so fast. So uh, basically I'm going to talk about three things, uh, the symbolic loop uh, in CNTK, um, how we do batching for recurrent networks uh, that make uh, CNTK's recurrent so fast. Uh, also talked a little bit about data parallel training. Um, so CNTK express uh, arbitrary networks and by composing simple um, building blocks into a complex graph and then it basically supports um, all kind of networks. So to use as an example, let me start with this uh, very simple two hidden layer neural network. Right? So it's a feed forward network. It contains two linear layers uh, with a sigmoid, and then at the end you have a softmax, uh, and that's uh, the network. So it's uh, very, very simple. Um, and uh, for those of you who have been playing with deep networks before, you know that you also need to define a loss function. So here we use a very standard uh, cross entropy, you know, train criteria, right? Just uh, y transpose log of the probability generated by softmax. So converting this. Um, basic mass equations into um, Python. This is how we represent this uh, uh, model in, in CNTK. So you basically write H1 is a sigmoid of X is a vector times a matrix W1 plus a bias. So you literally just write these equations in Python and you end up with this script. So once you write that script, um, CNTK will then compile it into a graph. So a graph look like uh, the one on the left-hand side. So uh, you notice that the bias, the weight matrices, the, these and the input X all becomes um, input to some nodes, where these nodes are literally just uh, functions. They do multiplication, they do plus, they do softmax. And then at the end, you have a softmax layer and a cross entropy layer. And so um, the, the reason we do this conversion into a graph is obviously, um, I mean, it's basically just for one big reason that is to do automatic differentiation. And so once you have the graph structure, it's very easy to derive uh, for any of the nodes um, in the graph, what is the derivative of it um, with respect to the, the loss uh, with respect to any of the nodes inside the graph. And so this uh, uh, differentiation is completely automatic. And then uh, we have deferred computation, which will execute this graph uh, at high speed. Uh, so this is a design, I think, uh, pioneered by Ciano, and then you know, took by both uh, TensorFlow and uh, CNTK as well. So it's a static graph, compile, and then run uh, very fast. Uh, the, the graph is editable. You can clone this as well. So it's like a Lego. You can compose uh, and trying to build all kind of networks. So the three unique things I'm going to talk about, uh, symbolic loops, parallel training with uh, mini-batching, and uh, um, cross-GPU parallel training. So let's take this example that we just had uh, and extend it a little bit. Let's make it a recurrent network. So to make a return network, uh, what we need to do is basically in the linear equation that we had before, we're going to add uh, one more term. So um, in the first equation of H1, we're adding a time uh, variable, and then um, the, the uh, uh, H1t is going to be dependent on H1t minus 1, which is the previous time step. And you take the H1t minus 1, you multiply a matrix R1. And so this is uh, basically, so, so on the left-hand side are these equations, so you can easily understand that. And on the Python side, uh, CNTK has a keyword called pass value. So essentially you just write pass value of H1 uh, and then times a matrix R1. And this is all you do in Python. So you can see how easy it is to write a recurrent network in CNTK. Uh, it's very straightforward. Um, so inside the CNTK, once uh, uh, we saw this, uh, the, the, the CNTK saw this code, it basically represent this thing, this uh, recurrent thing, path value, as a symbolic loop. So this is the red uh, circles inside the, the graph. Uh, so basically, I mean, um, 
this is speech, so we, we're familiar with all these Z transform signal processing kind of stuff. So Z, Z minus one is a time delay, and then you have this uh, graph that represents how uh, the whole network uh, should look like. And once, um, once the graph is built, then CNTK automatically unrolls the circles at execution time. And so circles are detected with uh, Targen's algorithm, and then um, it only includes nodes in the cycles. And then it can be run very efficient and uh, composed, uh, very easily composed with others. Now, just as a comparison, if you write the same recurrent network in TensorFlow, uh, this is before the 1.0 release where they simplify writing recurrent network. This is how you're going to write in the low level API. Uh, so it's uh, much more complicated. You have to manually unroll things, uh, which is uh, not easy to understand. Um, the second uh, major feature of CNTK, which is um, also rooted from the uh, kind of gene of the, the speech gene of CNTK, um, is to handle variable length sequences. So in uh, either speech or in language processing, where you have sentences of different lenses, for example, you know, there are training samples that are maybe uh, 20 word long, there are sentences which are five word long. So how do you put them together and train? And so most of the other toolkits, actually I think probably every other toolkit out there uh, does this bucketing thing where they try to put similar lens sequences into one bucket, one meta batch, and then try and train it. Uh, the, the issue with that approach is certainly you kind of uh, disrupted the, the randomization of the training data. So manually you're doing some organization of the data where for one minute batch you only see long sequence, one minute batch you only see short sequence. Um, so what we want to do in CNTK is somewhat differently. So we want to basically have these long and short sequ sequences being able to train in a single minute batch. Now if you just uh, stack them uh, row by row and train them as a minute batch, um, then you realize that you got a, a lot of, uh, so the sequence one is running well, sequence two already finished, so the GPU gets hungry and does nothing. And so that makes most of the recurrent implementation of other toolkits uh, very slow because the GPU is idle. It's not doing any job. So in CNTK, uh, we have this idea called the batching, which essentially concatenate the short sequences into a longer one. So in this particular case, if the toolkit realized that the total length of sequence two and three sum up is less than the sequence one, they will just schedule them into the same slot. So that particular G, um, processing unit handling this particular sample can run a lot longer than before. Uh, this looks trivial, but in reality, uh, maybe 30, 40 percent of the CNTK code is handling how do you, you know, treat this boundary when you switch from sequence two to sequence three. Uh, where the state need to be reinitialized, and during eval you have to have masking to handle things. So this is complicated, but we done this all inside CNTK. User is completely unaware of any of this uh, packing happening. You just write your code, randomize your data, and just send it into CNTK. You don't need to worry about anything uh, for this. So it's fully transparent. Uh, so. Recur so we basically have three levels, right? So recurrent, uh, CNTK unrolls, you don't need to unroll manually. Um, for the parallel training, you don't need to worry about batching them. And uh, during the uh, eval, you don't need to worry about how to mask them uh, to do sequence reductions. And uh, the last uh, kind of feature I like to mention is the parallel training of uh, uh, CNTK. Um, there are basically different levels of parallel training. Uh, you know, if it's uh, one single vector sample, usually that's called a vectorized um, um, parallelization. And then across multiple samples, we typically call it batching. And then we have across multiple GPUs. This is async PCIe device, devi device transfer, as well as across multiple servers. This requires uh, MPI, and that's what we use, and also Lately, I think uh, uh, during the latest uh, NVIDIA GTC, just in May, uh, they demonstrated using uh, CNTK working with uh, NICO 2.0. Uh, that's a cross-machine transmission communication protocol 
uh, that can be used to speed up uh, cross machine training. Um, so for CNTK, um, we focus uh, mostly on data parallel training because we believe that's kind of the most natural way of handling uh, parallelization. Um, we haven't seen you know, many models that is so big that current GPU cannot hold, while well, we see a lot of advantage of doing uh, data parallel training. So this is kind of the very naive way of doing data parallel training. So essentially you have uh, um, you, s you have a bunch, many bunch, uh, many batch of data you send into uh, multiple nodes. Uh, then these nodes does do their you know gradient descent, calculate the gradient automat uh, themselves, and then you run it all reduce by taking all their gradient, sum them into together, and then redistribute back into all the nodes. Now this certainly creates a bottleneck at the node who does the uh, summation of all the gradient and uh, it can certainly be improved. So a better algorithm would actually be uh, basically slice the model into multiple chunks and then f ask each of the nodes to handle one specific chunk. And so you can see that uh, here, basically the first chunk is handled by node one, for example, and then two and three nodes both send their particular gradient for that chunk to node one for aggregation. So every node does part of the model, and then at the end, you basically exchange these partial gradient, aggregated gradient of the model um, back to all the nodes, and so you do synchronization. So this is a well-known algorithm called the ring. Uh, it's uh, essentially O1 respect to K, where K is the total number of nodes. Uh, so um, it's, it's considered a quite efficient way of doing um, synchronous uh, gradient descent. Now, um, remember that, you know, um, the, the CNTK started with the speech model, so at that time, uh, uh, most of the models are speech models, and uh, speech at that time mostly used dense connected layers. So if you take a typical dense connected layers with a many batch size, say 1024, um, say the typical model having 160 million model parameters, and you can see that the amount of time to compute these uh, um, gradients is about one-seventh of a second, while the communication is about one-ninth of a second. So th you cannot even parallelize this task into two GPUs because the communication cost <coughs> just uh, already dominates the whole thing. So what CNTK, uh, of course, um, um, there has been a lot of paper at that time doing asynchronous training and uh, However, it does not really change the problem fundamentally because all the gradients still have to be transmitted. So we have basically, as a CNTK, we have looked into two possible ways to reduce communication cost. Uh, the first way, which is uh, quite well known in the um, toolkit, deep learning toolkit uh, literature, it's called a one-bit SDD. So instead of uh, transmitting the whole precision gradient across these machines, the idea is that let's quantize this gradient into one bit. So you got one bit quantized uh, when you send from node two, node three to node one for aggregation, and then also one bit quantized uh, when you send across to all the nodes back for aggregate, um, for composing the overall uh, gradient and the model. And uh, the, of course, when you do such heavy quantization, you lose accuracy. And the trick that we have, uh, this is a paper by Frank Side and a number of uh, MSR researchers, is to carry over the quantization error into the next mini batch. And uh, it turned out this works very well. Uh, essentially, the communication co costs reduced by a factor of uh, 32. And uh, it enables us to train really large speech models in production clusters. Uh, with a very fast and high scalability. Um, the next idea is, is basically to communicate less often. Uh, so the f this actually contains two works. And the first idea is called automatic mini-batch siding. Uh, essentially, uh, what these researchers found is that at the very beginning of a deep learning model training, you tend to use uh, smaller uh, mini-batch sizes because it's crucial to have a, a smaller mini-batch size to make sure the 
model converges to high accuracy. However, when it goes towards, you know, when, when you have, like, say, t 5, 10, 15 epochs in, um, they find that now you can safely increase the size of the mini batch. You can um, make uh, the mini batch size to even an order, I think, uh, believe on the order of 100,000 uh, speech models. And so this drastically improves the um, training speed of uh, uh, CNTK on large uh, production scale work workloads. Uh, so this paper was published in ICASP uh, 2014. A uh, similar idea has been recently presented by Facebook on ResNet 50, where they were able to train uh, 250 on 256 GPUs uh, for ResNet 50 in one hour. Um, so we have this in over four, three years already. Um, and then the second idea is called the block momentum. Uh, I'm not going into details about how this algorithm works, uh, but essentially it's, uh, it combines model average with some uh, error residue idea by uh, looking at each of the nodes update as a, a gradient update where we add on top a momentum term uh, to make the uh, gradient update more smooth, and that turned out to work extremely well, even better than the one bit STD. So all these have been included in CNTK, and you can just uh, play uh, with it. Um, so uh, I talk a lot of this. Mostly, I kind of uh, focus on the speech aspect of uh, you know how these are designed. But I want to also mention that today's CNTK is much more broader than uh, low working on c uh, speech tasks. So as Sanyang had showed earlier. A lot of people have been using CNTK for uh, image tasks, language tasks, um, um, and uh, they were all uh, very successful. So I think uh, this is the last section. I'm going to briefly talk about uh, if you want to give CNTK a try, uh, what are the resources you have? So uh, we think the, the, the best place to start you know, learning about CNTK is go through these uh, tutorials. Uh, so CNTK has a long list of tutorials. I think uh, it's probably today is over 15 of them. Um, essentially explain uh, how you can use CNTK to do simple tasks like uh, you know, uh, creating a feed forward network, how do you do ConvNet with MNIST, how do you do ResNet, how do you predict the stock market, how do you uh, do forecasting using data from IoT device, uh, Etc. So there's a lot of uh, a style transfer, uh, text translation, etc. So just read them. I think it's a good education for both what is deep learning as well as how you can use uh, CNTK to do uh, uh, solve these tasks. Um, and CNTK, as uh, mentioned earlier, is a completely open source with MIT license on GitHub. So you can go to GitHub uh, CNTK's GitHub main, pa main page, and there are three major sources. The tutorials I just mentioned, we also have a lot of examples. Uh, I want to say a bit about these examples. Um, so uh, if you go to other toolkits, in particular, I mean, we recently experienced uh, like MXNet where they have, you know, examples, but some of the examples you cannot even run. There's even typos in the script. So you essentially cannot run this. Uh, the examples in CNTK, we actually spend a lot of time verifying them. Uh, by verifying, uh, we mean that researchers actually uh, port models from other toolkits, and we spend a lot of time making sure that these models are running as they, uh, they should be. Um, so I, I, I think most of you probably heard about Google's uh, Inception v3 model, which is, uh, you know, uh, Google made it and then released open source. Uh, the model, but nobody was able to train the Inception v3 model even on TensorFlow. Uh, you, you cannot get the identical accuracy. So um, researchers in, in our team basically spend a lot of effort, um, uh, and uh, we were able to create the Inception uh, v3 model essentially um, with accuracy that matches or even surpasses the original paper. So that took us like a month to do such kind of job, but we believe it's very valuable uh, that we make sure our models, examples are really high quality and you can reproduce numbers. Uh, we also uh, recently, uh, with a lot of requests, adding a new uh, section called manuals where it explains better 
Uh, if you want to say debug CNTK, what do you want to do? Things like that. Um, if you don't have, uh, if you don't want to even download the CNTK, here's another resource. You can go to this Azure notebooks. These are free notebooks. Just go to uh, Microsoft Azure notebooks and you go there, and there are a bunch of uh, tutorials there. Uh, you can just read them. Um, I think they are also good resource for you to say teach uh, students because you know it's it's freely accessible by uh, uh, everyone. Uh, CNTK's documentation has been also improved quite a bit. We have a, a dedicated uh, website for all the documentations. Uh, the Python is a, a different um, documentation set, uh, which is also very easily uh, searchable. And uh, Sanyang and uh, uh, Roland, another um, scientist in Microsoft, also created the edX course uh, on deep learning and uh, CNTK. So you guys can uh, give it a try. Um, so as a conclusion, CNTK is fast, scalable, extensible. Um, some of the unique features make CNTK really stand out, um, particularly if you handle any of the recurrent networks, it's extremely fast. We're seeing about five to 10x faster than uh, any other toolkits out there. Um, and you can verify it yourself. Um, and we have a lot of education resource and you can um, um, take a look at them. And it is a completely open source project. Uh, we also welcome your contributions. You know, um, um, we're trying to cultivate a community. It takes us some efforts, but you know, we think uh, it will be good to um, have a large community working on the toolkit. And that's all we have. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so we can take some questions, I believe. Yeah, we can take questions afterwards. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I have a Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Yeming Chen from Shanghai Jiao Tong University in China. Today, I'm very glad to join this session and have the opportunity to talk about uh, the research in my laboratory. As we have seen, speech recognition has been deployed in many applications. Uh, however, there are still many unsolved problems when making the machines to transcribe, to transcribe the real world uh, the real world speech everywhere. Today, I will mainly talk about uh, uh, the new challenges in speech recognition and present the corresponding technologies and uh, the recent progress developed in the SGTU speech lab. Another main feature uh, about the technologies uh, which I will talk about today is that all the advances and achievements uh, were developed with assistance from the CNTK. There has been a long, uh, the research on speech recognition has been a long history, and uh, this task needed to recognize the word sequence when giving the speech waveform as an observation. The problem can be formulated as this uh, objective, to, recognize, to find the best word sequence W to maximize the, the probability PW given O, O is the observation. By the, theor uh, by the Bayesian theory and the chain rules, this objective can be further decomposed into four probabilities, which are related to the four modules in speech recognition systems. They are feature extraction, acoustic model, lex model, and uh, language model. The decoding process will integrate all the knowledge from the four modules to obtain the final speech recognition result. <coughs> thanks, to the, thanks to the significant uh, achievement on deep learning technologies during the current years, there has been a great progress on speech recognition. 
more and more speech recognition applications have been surpassed the threshold for adoption in some real world scenarios and enable the services such as the Microsoft Cartona, Apple Siri, Google Now to be commonly used. And uh, more recently, the speaker products uh, receive, more, uh, receive, receive tremendous interest from the industry, such as Amazon Echo, Google Home, Microsoft Invoke, and uh, Apple HomePod. Uh, this is also showed in Saya and the child's slide. Uh, this is the progress on the famous, uh, uh, famous task on telephone speech recognition on switchboard. Here list uh, the system comp comparison during the last, uh, last few years. The first bar is the best system still using the shallow model in 2011, and the others are as a method using the deep learning based approaches. Later last year and uh, early this year, bo both Microsoft and IBM obtain the new world Art milestone below 6.0%, which are also announced to achieve the human parity. However, I wanted to ask, is it really good enough to make the machine to transcribe the real world speech everywhere? And uh, does the speech recognition technologies really achieve the human parity? Actually, there are still many unsolved problems. And uh, I summarized and list here, which are also the new, uh, the new challenges and the research frontier in speech recognition. They are noise robust, multi-genre, low resource, mix on multilingual, low computation, and uh, rich transcription. Today, I will discuss some of them and uh, present the related technologies and the progress in our lab. The first one I want to mention is noise robust. Speech recognition has been claimed to achieve the high accuracy. However, most of them are still constrained in the, in the clean collision speech with closed talk microphones. I think everyone has seen uh, in, the, uh, in the keynote le lecture room and the Microsoft have set up the speech transcription systems for the speakers. But we can see that every speaker needs uh, need a closed talk microphone and uh, in the relative quiet uh, environment. So the signal, signal noise ratio is uh, higher. Although we have used a deep learning based method, there are still large degradations when uh, deploys the speech recognition systems in the noisy scenarios, such as uh, uh, bus station, coffee house, meeting room, when facing all kinds of additive noise type, reverberation, and the channel distortion. The main problem for noisy, noise robust speech recognition is the mismatch between training and the testing. The system is fragile in the reality due to the mismatch from the background noise, channel, speaker, accent, and, uh, and other factors in the reality. Although we can collect much data, but uh, the, the scenarios in reality are so many that we, can cover, we cannot cover all the conditions. Adaptation is one effective method to reduce the mismatch. So how to uti utilize the, the limited data to do faster and effective adaptation is one main research topic for noise robust speech recognition. Several adaptation strat strategies are developed uh, in our lab. The first one is named the cluster adaptive training. In this method, uh, the multiple bases are formed to construct uh, the canonical parametric space. Uh, for example, we can use uh, uh, layer weight metrics as the basis in DNN, on feature maps, on filters as basis in CNN. During adaptation, we only need to estimate the in, uh, interpolation vectors to combine the different, di different bases to form the final adapted model. Since we only need to predict and update the in interpolation vector, so the number of parameters are very smaller than the existing DM based adaptation method. Here are some experiment results uh, under the different uh, scenarios. One is for DM based cluster adaptive training, another is, is the CN based cl cluster adaptive training. We can see our proposed uh, method can get a uh, very large, significant uh, improvement on the different scenarios. And uh, the appropriate uh, basis selection is very important uh, when, when, 
uh, when implement uh, the cluster depth training for speech recognition. Another method is named the environment aware training. We want the, the deep models can predict and perceive the environment change always so that the models can adjust the parameters simultaneously to address the environmental variability. In this method, the factor representation is the first step. Different from the conventional approaches, DNs are used to do all factor representation, including speaker, phone, room, noise type, and so on. And then we designed uh, information exchange mechanisms to integrate all the factors into the main speech recognition model. And uh, these uh, mechanisms also enable all the modules can benefit from each other. Another ad advantage is that this uh, deep model based factors are not ruled out as the traditional factors, and all the factors can be combined to get uh, another uh, additional improvement. In addition to the adaptation, we also uh, explore the acoustic modeling, the new acoustic modeling, which can do the automatic uh, noise removing, uh, removing embedding so that the, ex the explicit adaptation or noise removing are not needed. Inspired by the VGG and the ResNet uh, in image processing, we also explore the similar structure with the suitable adjustment uh, in speech recognition at the first time. Here list some uh, very deep convolutional neural network architectures in our experiment. We find, we find that the appropriate pooling, padding, and uh, input channel usage are very important uh, in speech recognition. Here is the uh, result com uh, comparison on the different models. We can see the proposed very deep convolutional ne neural network achieves promising results in the noisy scenarios. And uh, it is much better than the recurrent neural network uh, in these uh, noisy scenarios. With the in-depth analysis, we can find the very deep convolution, convolution neural network can reduce the noise embedding, and uh, it can, it can denoise on derivation gradually across the stacked convolution layers. More detail can be referred to our translation paper. To take, uh, on, the, uh, to take on the advantages uh, method mentioned above, we further integrate all the techniques into one framework to get a more advanced system. Some architectures are listed here, and uh, we found the system performance can be further significantly boosted with all these technologies. Now, let's have a look at uh, the system comparison on the standard, uh, standard noisy speech recognition task on Aura 4. Here list uh, the best system performance for each year over the last uh, uh, last five years, and uh, the first bar is the previous uh, system using the shallow model, which are developed in the Cambridge University in 2012. The last ones, the left ones, uh, are the systems using the deep models, and uh, the result with the dashed uh, line box are developed in our lab. We can see during the uh, during the last three years, our system, which are developed uh, using the uh, mentioned. Uh, the above mentioned technologies got the, got the best systems. And uh, particularly, the recent uh, obtained uh, result of 5.7% water average is a new milestone on Aura 4. It is a huge progress for noise robust speech recognition. Okay, the second challenge I want to mention is multi genre. Most of the current uh, speech applications are mainly focused on focus on one genre or one condition, such as the speech input on voice search on our mobile and uh, the telephone on reading transcription systems. If using one application to the other conditions, the, the genre on the topic mismatch is very large, so the accuracy will decrease dramatically. So how to construct a general speech recognition system to process uh, this kind of multi-genre data is very challenging. The data from BBC on YouTube are uh, this kind of data. Another difficulty is from the uh, complex audio and uh, the low quality transcripts. Because th the different audios are recorded with the different scenarios and uh, it has a different uh, 
uh, background noise, and the speech type is also unnorm unnormal. And uh, most of this, uh, uh, most of this uh, program is uh, have the subtitles, so the word error is very high on the transcripts. It nearly approached 30 to 40 percent word error for the labels, and even no accurate time for these uh, labels. So how to build the systems using this kind of data will be very difficult. Now let's watch a video to better understand uh, what is called multi-genre first. Forever try to get him into tighter pants. He's like, nope, that's gay. I'm like, no, it's Paul Smith. I'm like, right, that's British. <laughs> Irving, between the circles, down to our left. Irving's picked up by Steph Curry, six to shoot. He's at the right point. He stutter steps. He launches a three. Hey! Nailed it! It's over! Need a medic. And you for the bill. A six week might have inch. You won't even know I've gone for. Georgie! All new Argo. Coming soon to BBC One. So you can see the genre difference is very large between the different uh, programmings. So build the transcription system for this data is very uh, challenging. To better utilize this kind of data, the first step is how to do the subtitle alignment so we can get more accurate uh, transcriptions and uh, time information for system building. The diverse audio and the diverse transcriptions are the two main difficulties. And uh, the lightly supervised alignment framework is designed, including the stages such as lightly supervised decoding, split point detection, segment merging, non speech filter, and uh, data selection. Uh, this is a demo for the alignment. There are, there are three lines. The first uh, green line is the uh, uh, original subtitles provided by BBC. And uh, the second yellow line is the uh, realigned output of from our final system. And uh, we, did, we don't need uh, to care the last line. The, last line just, uh, the white line just is uh, the temporary output from our system. We just need uh, to compare the first green line to the second yellow line. You can see the time, the time information about the subtitles can be improved significantly. After the data processing on the subtitles, and then we can do the acoustic model and the language modeling. For the acoustic modeling, we use the deep model based hybrid and tandem systems. And then the different system can be combined using the joint decoding. Moreover, the acoustic adaptation is also implemented on this, uh, this kind of acoustic model to reduce the acoustic condition mismatch, which can improve the general mismatch, uh, mismatch significantly. 
For the language model, the recurrent neural network based language model with topic adaptation were developed. It is uh, then implemented to do the faster lattice rescoring to obtain better speech recognition systems, uh, uh, speech recognition result. Here's a demo for the transcription system. And there are also three lines. The first green line is the menu transcription, uh, tra the menu transcription. And uh, the second yellow line is the output from the official released uh, baseline system. And uh, so the third white line is the output from our best system. We can do them some comparison with the different lines. First things first, congratulations on Gloucester's Player of the Season, and that was a, a nice way to celebrate it today. Yeah, it was. It was great. It wasn't. It was never about um, about individuals. You know, today was a, a real team performance, a gutsy effort. It's been like that all season, and um, obviously we're not going to get we're not going to get ahead of ourselves now. It's a great win for us, uh, but now we need to get ready for the playoffs next week. We talked, you know, probably about this game being a bit of a try fest, but we uh, we talked about how to shut them down. I thought we did a tremendous job. Unfortunately, our kicking game didn't go. Didn't, didn't go as well as it sometimes does. Uh, so we, we ended up giving them the ball a lot of time and letting them counter attack back at us. While Bath were vacating second spot, Wasps were taking their place. After going behind early on at relegated leads, they ran in a hatful of tries, the main beneficiary being Tom Boyce, back from injury and grabbing a hat trick, and Rafael Ibanez winning the worst dive of the week award. Se we can see the output of our system is much better than the baseline, and uh, the accuracy is even approaches the manual transcription systems. And uh, this system also gets the MGB challenge in 215, got to the first position. The last challenge I want to mention is the cocktail party problem in speech processing. Uh, this is the definition for cocktail party problem from Cherry in the middle of the last century. One of our most important uh, faculties is our ability to listen to and follow one speaker in the presence of others. This is such a common experience that we may take it for granted. We may call it a cocktail party problem. It is easy for humans, but it is very difficult for the machine to do processing with this kind of data. Humans can process as many as six uh, interference talkers with the equally loud speech, but uh, in contrast, the two talker mixed speech is even very hard for the machine, the, uh, for the machine's processing. In the cocktail party environment, we are mainly focused on three problems. The multi-talker speech separation, uh, which aims to separate and trace the stream of the mixed sp the speech. The multi-talker speech recognition, not only to do the, se uh, the speech separation, we only need to recognize what has been said in each stream. Multi-talker speaker identification. In addition to the content of the mixed stream, we also want to know who are speaking in this mixed stream. The first one is multi-talker sp uh, speech separation. The traditional methods are normally unsupervised, including the CASA, NMF, Factorial GMM HM based one. With the increase, uh, with, uh, with the increase interest on deep learning, deep learning, the deep models start to convert the problem from an unsupervised learning problem to a supervised one. However, previous deep learning based method can only work well in the seen speakers on the specific interferences. It cannot uh, work very well on the unseen speakers, mainly due to the label permutation problems. The label permutation problem, problem is that when giving the mixed speech, we don't know whether it is A plus B or B plus A. So we cannot assign the supervision for the individual output correctly. This picture shows uh, the traditional uh, deep learning based mo uh, method for the speech separation. We can see we, we assign the fixed order uh, supervisions for the two output. But due to the label permutation problem, this assumption is not very accurate. To address these problems, we pro uh, proposed the permutation invar in, uh, invariant uh, training pro uh, method. The motivation is easy. When giving this, uh, the, mixed, uh, the, the mixed speech for speech separation, we actually don't care it is A plus B on B plus A. 
we only care the quality of the separate single speech. So in PIT training, we treat the, we, we, we treat the source target as a set. And uh, during the training, it first determines the, it first, it first determines the best uh, output target uh, assignment uh, to minimize the error at the utterance level based on the forward, forward pass result. And it then optimize the model using this assignment. The PIT training can automatically determine the label, the best label assignment based on the current model, and it can be used to separate multiple speech streams. It can also be easily extended to even more speakers, three speaker or four speaker. And another advantage is that it only affects the training and uh, no extra processing are during the, uh, the separation. This picture shows the architecture for the PIT training. You can see the main difference is on the top. It will do the pairwise scoring on the output to determine the best uh, label, uh, label target assignment. Said the similar idea are extended to the multi-talker speech recognition. Previous uh, method can only do the multi-talker speech recognition on the thin speakers and uh, with a relatively easy task such as uh, uh, is isolated word speech recognition. And uh, it normally you need uh, the explicit s speech separation plus a normal speech recognition modules to do the whole pipeline. We extend the PIT training to speech recognition and uh, evaluate uh, the criterion on the cross-entropy cross level. It can do the separation tracing and recognition in one shot without uh, any explicit separation stage. After the model training, uh, the, the trained uh, PIT models can recognize the multiple, the multiple speech streams in, in the mixed, uh, mixed audio simultaneously. Here are the architectures for the PIT training in the multi-talker speech recognition. This is the uh, this is the uh, experiment experiment res uh, result on the PID training for multi-talker speech recognition. The top small one is the uh, normal single speaker model to recognize the normal single speaker single uh, uh, single speaker speech. It is uh, a meeting transcription uh, corpus named AMI. And uh, this bottom one. Uh, is, is that we use this uh, single speaker model to recognize the, mixed s the two talker mixed speech directory. From the result, we can see the ability of the single speaker model is limited uh, to recognize the multi talker mixed speech. And uh, there are very large degradations for both two speakers. And especially for the low energy speaker, the word error rate is even higher than 100%. It uh, demonstrates the, the high challenge for this task. And uh, this last table is the result uh, using our proposed PIT training on multi-talker speech recognition. We can see there are both very large improvement on both two speakers for different SNR. Although the word error are still very high and, uh, far and far from the real implementation, but it, it is still very promising. The last one is multi-talker speaker identification. We want to know who are speaking in this uh, cocktail party uh, environment. The traditional method uh, also will use the explicit uh, speech separation and the speaker identification stages. And uh, the normal shallow models will be used uh, for this task. Recently, end-to-end uh, -end deep learning based approaches are proposed for this uh, task. In these models, the speech waveform on the speech features are fed into the, the deep models. And the KO divergence are evaluated uh, between the output of the deep model and uh, the soft speak labels, which are obtained from the energy ratio mask. After the model training, in the testing, we just need uh, to calculate uh, the utterance level score to uh, do the final decision to obtain the who are speaking in this mixed um, speech. This architecture is also very easy to extend uh, for more speakers, three on five, uh, four on five speakers. Now let me show you some samples. We evaluate this method on two kinds of corpus. One is the normal English, uh, uh, English multi-talker speech, and another is a more difficult uh, Chinese song chorus. 
First, let, uh, let us lessen some samples. This is the uh, normal two mixed speech, two, uh, two talker mixed speech. Please, one point six, please. This is the four talker mixed speech. Please, 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 Okay. For the chorus, it is a Chinese song. This is a two, two, uh, two speaker. This is a four speaker. The task on the chorus is much difficult because the, all the time, uh, the, the frequency time beings are almost the same between the different speakers. So it is infeasible to do the normal speech separation first with the traditional method. The table shows the result uh, with the end-to-end -end deep learning method to do this uh, speak ID on multi-talker mixed speech. And we can see this method can get very high accuracy on the normal multi-talker mixed speech. The result on the chorus is relatively uh, much worse, but it is still pr very promising. If using the traditional method as shallow models, the, the error rate is nearly approaching uh, 90, uh, 90 on 80. At last, I wanted to talk about uh, the toolkit uh, in our development. The CNTK was used in our lab since two uh, 2014, and the forename is still com Computational Neural Network Toolkit Z. And it is initially developed in the speech and the dialogue group in Microsoft for speech recognition system, uh, uh, speech, speech related applications. But now it is not only for speakers, uh, speech, but also for other AI tasks. We also tried the other toolkit in our lab, but we found that the CNTK can make the model training and uh, the system building more flexible, efficient, and e effective. And all the advances uh, mentioned in, in my talk uh, are developed uh, with the assistance from the CNTK. Here is the main reference about the technologies I mentioned in this talk. Finally, I want to thank for my colleague and the student in SDTU. Thanks for the collaboration with Microsoft and thanks for the CNTK team. Thank you very much. So thanks for this impressive presentation. Uh, my, my question is, uh, how long uh, can this precision can be maintained? For instance, this is for the, for the 10 seconds, uh, let's say, segments we have, or, uh, or it can be extended to minutes or uh, longer uh, dialogues between uh, speakers? How, how long? Yes. What is the length of the uh, speech segments? You mean for that training or testing? Uh, whatever. Uh, actually, it is very difficult to collect the data for this mi for this uh, multi-talker mixed speech. So we need to simul do, to do some simulations to uh, to do the aug data augmentation to obtain very large for very large data set for training. Uh, and in testing, the length is only about. Uh, uh, three seconds and to five seconds, it is not very long. Hi, uh, I have a question for the CNTK team. Um, so we have seen lots and lots of frameworks over the years and every company seems to want to build their own new framework and uh, first of all, what is your thought on it? Do you think this is healthy? 
And the second thing is, if you don't think it's healthy, what is the way out of it? Right, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, yes, uh, every company wants to build their own toolkit. Um, uh, from Microsoft, I mean, at least from uh, our perspective, um, I think at certain point there will be some standardization of the toolkits. Uh, there has been already like high level uh, toolkits like Keras become really popular and they have right now backends of uh, Ciano, TensorFlow, CNTK. And I think MXNet is also building a, a backend for Keras. So uh, I think uh, overall I see basically you can build the industry standard for two, uh, two levels. One is at the API level, high level API, where everybody can, like things like Keras. Uh, another level is at the graph level, where the intermediate representation uh, that's used to compile code into execution. Um, that level, I think, uh, currently there are also a lot of efforts in building the intermediate representation, and uh, uh, we see some opportunity there, and we'll, we'll see how it, it pans out. Yeah, the other thing is the problem domains that each of these different toolkits face are quite uh, unique in their own business sense. So in aggregating those, they attack the problems in a very different way. For instance, you see the CNTK's strength comes in the recurrence domain, right? I mean, it, it was very obvious to you. So having a cohort of toolkits really enables you to build best of the breed. And at some point when you come together, it just makes the whole ecosystem of deep learning so much richer. And the, the good part is all of these are in open source. There's a question over here. Thanks for the talks. Um, I, was, I also have a question to the CNTK team. Um, so I was wondering uh, when you distill the models at the end like into the binary format to run it faster, like what kind of resources that does that require? Can that run on a phone? Yes. Um, so uh, if you look at the uh, one bit uh, convolution that uh, Sayan demonstrated, uh, so in that particular case, we're using Halide, which is a, a, a compiler that can compile code into all kinds of devices. Uh, I think TensorFlow is doing XLA, which is kind of very similar. Um, um, so, so yeah, I, I, we see that as uh, currently, you know, the, if you want to create models that can execute really fast on different devices, uh, that seems to be a, a very good way to achieve that. I would say that's true for uh, the evaluation part. Right. So you'll see, you know, with the things like the one-bit compression, you'll see evaluation move to you know uh, low computational devices like the phone but training still remains the province of the cloud yeah so what I found in my deep learning research is that we often look at using various toolkits yes. but then we wind up rolling our own code because the toolkits are too narrow in what they do which mm -hmm. maybe is fine for doing standard applications with you know standard architectures and doing backprop but what if, you know? Do you have any thoughts about making, for example, CNTK more flexible? Yes. Uh, which would be more useful for research, but then also in the long term, you know, might help, might actually help it, yes. you know, prevail in, in 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 industrial applications. So extensibility is one of the things that I mean. I think I mentioned we mentioned in the slides, but didn't really expand much. Um, so, uh, in terms of extensibility for CNTK. Um, almost uh, every component is, uh, can be written in a custom way. So CNTK supports extended uh, custom uh, learners, customer, uh, custom readers, <coughs> custom uh, layers, whatever you want to write. Uh, we basically expose the interface where people can write C++ or Python code uh, to be integrated with CNTK. Uh, actually, um, recently we've been working on some models that uh, uh, we literally just took some cafe layers in Python and we just, uh, you know, from CNTK call into Python and do the calculation and come back to CNTK and continue the calculation. So uh, uh, we are quite flexible in that regard. Um, so and I think uh, uh, Cha presented that in a one slide where he, he highlighted the manuals. If you go inside the manuals, you'll find a wealth of information how you can do that. So, but yes, I mean, extensibility is good, but basically this just means that at that point you have to just roll your own code to plug in. Yes, yes, I mean, uh, well, 
I guess when you mean, you, you want to like completely automatic a layer construction? I want, for example, a broader set of primitives that I can, you know, that I can combine using the same oh. language. Yeah, I mean, Syntix supports a lot of primitives. We have like uh, 40 plus primitive operators that you can combine. Um, it may not completely cover everything, but it's quite extensive. I think the most extensive uh, is probably TensorFlow, but we are, we're catching up in, in that regard. And if you, are f if you find it missing, just go and put it yeah, in just the let issue. Us probably in the next uh, iteration we'll, you'll we'll add it. it. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. I yes. have a question. Uh, about the, the binary deep models, yes. did you do some evaluation on the other platform, not only the GPU or CPUs? Uh, yeah, so the, the code that we included in 2.0 release, that's actually CPU code. So yes. it's, it's about uh, 7x faster, uh, X faster. Uh, compared with regular convolution on CPU. Um, the, the, the ARM version that we have demos, I think that one is about 10 to 30x faster. 10 to 30? Yeah. Okay. So that's a lot faster. That's a, by the way, that's an AlexNet model. That we have experimented. Oh. Alex model, not a residue network. Uh, yeah, that one I believe it's it's not residue network. That was okay. just what we tested. This is what we tested. With okay. Other okay. Okay. okay, I see. Thanks. Any, other, any questions? other questions? Great. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thanks.